Welcome back to the Atlanta Falcons franchise, everyone. I'm your host, Husker Eurocat. Unfortunately, the Falcons were bested in the divisional playoff round by the Dallas Cowboys. So a successful season came to an end last week. Unfortunate for another reason, though. The Falcons made it all the way to the playoffs and even won the NFC South division, but it left them with a really bad situation when it comes to the draft, which Atlanta was counting on having better than a number 26 draft choice. There are some aging veterans on the roster, and the Falcons were counting on the draft to help change that. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. We still have lots of things that happen before the NFL draft. Some of those things are what you may have expected, and, well, some are not. The Falcons have made some moves and signed some personnel that, while it makes the team much younger, it makes them much more inexperienced, and we'll have to see how that's reflected in the coming season. First, though, we have the rest of the 2021 season to complete. As we left things in the divisional round, we already knew that the Cardinals and Bengals had moved on to their conference championship games. Obviously, the Cowboys do as well. But the shocker was that the Denver Broncos knocked off the number one seeded Las Vegas Raiders and scored a lot of points doing it. 41 to 31. So the conference championships pitted the Cowboys and Cardinals in the NFC and the Broncos and Bengals in the AFC. The winner of those championship games successfully made it to Super Bowl 56 in SoFi Stadium. The Cincinnati Bengals and the Dallas Cowboys move on. The Broncos traveled to Cincy for a defensive battle with the Bengals in which Cincinnati, with a late score, moved on to the Super Bowl. Dallas visited the desert to play the Cardinals, and the Cowboys regained their halftime lead with a late touchdown to C.D. Lamb, taking a win out of Glendale in order to move on to the Super Bowl to meet the Bengals. Before that, though, we have the NFL Pro Bowl. First, we'll take a look at the roster and see if any of your favorite players made the Pro Bowl this season, as well as look for any Falcons that were voted to be in the game. The first three on the list for the NFC are Rodgers, Murray, and Darnold. Now, why was Darnold never good enough to make the Pro Bowl when he was with the Jets? Answer that one for me. Mahomes is the AFC's third string quarterback. <laughs> really? Kind of hard to believe since he is a 97 overall. Cordero Patterson makes the Pro Bowl roster, albeit the third string halfback. Nice to see him have a good season given that he was traded to the Titans and ended up back with the Falcons to round out the season. After 17 years in the NFL, Richie Incognito makes the AFC squad. Definitely the old man on the roster since Tom Brady didn't make the Pro Bowl this season. Another player from the Falcons to make the NFC side is right guard Chris Lindstrom. Now in his fourth year in the league, he had a great season for Atlanta. Both Nick and Joey Bosa make the Pro Bowl this year. A lot of talent in that family, kind of like the Watt brothers. Unfortunately, the only one that we've seen so far is JJ, who gets the vote into this year's game. Von Miller and Chandler Jones are a testament to the fact that it's not just the kids that can play this game both in their 30s and each at the top of their game. Well, I've noticed something that needs some definite improvement from the Falcons organization, and that is no defensive players on the NFC roster come from Atlanta. What a disappointment, and shows that 
some changes are needed on that side of the line for sure. How did this Pro Bowl class perform? Well, I really didn't expect this. It was the NFC in a kind of a landslide victory, 39 to 18. It was a pretty tight game until the fourth quarter when the NFC just took control and went on a 25 to eight scoring spree. Next, we have the annual awards for the 2021 season. A surprise to a very few, <laughs> Aaron Rodgers is your MVP. And the coach of the year was Dean Strauss of the Las Vegas Raiders. Getting in on the action was coach Turner Gill taking the number seven spot in the voting. The Outstanding Player Awards in the NFC starting with Offensive Player of the Year. Aaron Rodgers, of course, leads the way. And Matt Ryan is voted in at the fifth spot. On the defensive side of the ball, the Rams are well represented as Von Miller and Aaron Donald take the first two spots. The rookies are next, and the Offensive Rookie of the Year was Justin Fields from the Bears, while an honorable mention goes to Kyle Pitts that landed in at fourth place in the voting. As for the defense, left outside linebacker Aziz Ojolari took that honor in the NFC. Richie Grant, strong safety for the Falcons, takes spot number eight in the voting. Matt Ryan is the sixth quarterback, and Cordero Patterson ends up in third place for best running back. In the wide receiver category, Russell Gage Jr. takes the number six spot, and we don't have another Falcon get any honors until Dante Fowler Jr. lands in the fourth place linebacker spot. Then to round out the NFC honors, Youngway Koo takes the ninth spot in the kicking category. In the AFC, Josh Jacobs wins Offensive Player of the Year as Trey Hendrickson, currently with the Bengals, wins the Defensive Player of the Year honors. As for the rookies, in the AFC battle, Trevor Lawrence takes home the award for Offensive Rookie and right end Quiddy Pay out of Michigan locks down the Defensive Rookie of the Year. For the individual position honors, it's Herbert for quarterback and, of course, Josh Jacobs for running back. Jamar Chase lost Rookie of the Year to Trevor Lawrence, but won in the Best Wide Receiver category. Richie Incognito shows up again as the Best Offensive Lineman, and Best D Lineman also goes to our Defensive Player of the Year, Trey Hendrickson. Harold Landry III beats out Bradley Chubb for the Best Linebacker, and Bryce Callahan takes the honor for best defensive back. As the last honor, Chris Boswell takes the award for best kicker in the AFC. Well, now it's time for Super Bowl 56 between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Dallas Cowboys. And your winner was the Dallas Cowboys. It was a very competitive game, and although there were no turnovers, Ultimately, the Dallas ground game produced enough points in the fourth quarter to give the Cowboys a five-point victory. And now it was finally time for the 2022 offseason. And the first thing that Atlanta does is <laughs> trade their longtime quarterback, Matt Ryan. His contract is definitely top-heavy with the Falcons putting out over $80 million over the next two seasons. Therefore, Matt is now a Colt in exchange for picking up a third-round draft choice from the Colts. That now gave Atlanta a first round, four second round, and three third round draft selections. Still not the top 10 choice they were hoping for, but really a good top-end group of selections. 
Now came the time for re-signing players to new contracts. First up is Cordero Patterson. While he is a superstar, the Falcons thought they could get him a little cheaper in the draft, so they offered a contract that he was most likely going to say no to, and he did in fact do that. So we'll have to wait for free agency to find out if they got him back on the roster or not. Next is Foye Aluakun, and he has a quite unconventional request. <laughs> he was definitely bonus top-heavy. The Falcons weren't willing to risk losing his talent, so they offered him just over $27 million for a four-year contract, and he accepts to remain a Falcon. Next up was kicker Youngway Koo. Now, Atlanta wasn't sure about giving him a new contract with what he wanted, so they offered him considerably less, and of course he declined the offer in some pretty graphic terms. Duran Harmon, although being 31 years old, was offered a contract just because it was Atlanta's hope that he would be a good depth player because one of their focuses was going to be in the safety positions and he decided to test free agency. Now came Russell Gage Jr. And being a finalist for receiver of the year, he was probably going to command really good bucks. So the Falcons offered him a five-year, $25 million contract and got away with him accepting that offer. I would only assume that they had to feel pretty good about that negotiation. Tight end Hayden Hurst was next, and since he did such a good job as a backup to Kyle Pitts, even filling in for him during some injury time, Atlanta offered him just a touch over what he requested and he accepted the offer. Next was cornerback Fabian Moreau that was kept on as a solid backup and he accepted a one-year contract. Wide receiver John Ross was kind of a low overall player, but he did a really good job as a return specialist this last season, so he was given a low ball offer and he accepted the long-term contract. Another cornerback, Isaiah Oliver, that should be a good depth player, was offered a long-term inexpensive contract, and he accepted as well. 26-year-old right end Derek Barnett was offered a three-year contract, since he would be a good depth player. And if the Falcons didn't get a better defensive end, he could be a starter if needed, and he accepted that offer. Geronimo Allison proved to be a solid big body option in the slot, so Atlanta offered him a three-year deal for just under $10 million, and he accepted. Bryce Love was offered a three-year contract as well, Atlanta is hoping that he can be a solid backup to, well, to <laughs> whoever they end up signing, I guess. Um, wide receiver Braxton Berrios was offered a two-year contract. The thought was that he could be a solid backup receiver and possibly a backup return specialist in case John Ross gets injured which with what the Falcons dealt with towards the end of the season is not too far out of the realm of reality. Lastly, as a third tight end option, Josh Oliver was offered a three-year deal worth under a million dollars per year, and so he accepted that. Since that was the last of the offers, the rest were released to test free agency. At this point, it was time for <laughs> free agency. But Atlanta received some disturbing news that their number one wide receiver, Calvin Ridley, decided to retire from the game, citing personal reasons as the cause of his decision. So that should put a premium on getting another veteran out of free agency. What a curveball they had to deal with on that one, that's for sure. 
The outside linebacker free agency class this year is bad, to say the least. So the Falcons offer a substantial contract to Rashawn Evans in hopes that someone can be moved to the outside position, which was a very valid opportunity for someone. Of course, Cordero Patterson was offered a contract for less money than was offered in the negotiation phase, but still outbidded the Dolphins. Next, Atlanta was sure that they found a replacement for Calvin Ridley on the roster, uh, so they made an offer to Christian Kirk to try to outbid Indy. In need of some legitimate cornerback starter competition, an offer was made to 25-year-old Mike Hughes. The need for a solid defensive tackle presence was clear, so an offer was made to Jaron Reed in case a starter wasn't secured in the NFL draft. Just a little concerned that they may not get Rashawn Evans committed to a contract, Atlanta made an offer to Anthony Walker Jr. for a four-year contract. It would pay him $22.6 million. And giving them both an offer was a little cause for anxiety, but they had to cover themselves in order to fill out those outside linebacker positions. The last offer was given to Jimmy Garoppolo since the Falcons had no quarterbacks on roster at all and he would be a good veteran for at least a backup position. But depending on whether they can get a good quarterback out of the draft at their position, he could end up being the starter next season. Everyone except for Patterson accepts Atlanta's offers. That presented a couple of problems that needed to be solved. One, the Falcons lost a valuable asset in Patterson, so they needed to be able to find someone that was going to replace him. Two, <laughs> they were now top heavy in middle linebackers, so. <laughs> they needed to disperse that talent just a bit in order to make these acquisitions work out better. That brings us to the NFL Draft Recap. As I said before, Atlanta played better than expected and drew the 26th draft selection spot. So, in the first round, still available at Pick number 26 was Matt Corral. He ended up being a 70 overall normal development player, and unless something goes really great in camp and preseason, we may be seeing him backing up Jimmy G for, well, at least the season. We'll just have to see if he progresses to starter material before the regular season. The Falcons' next selection came in the second round, pick number three. The first of four in the second round, they chose another linebacker. Man, are they going to be top-heavy. Leo Chanel, number five. Well, I know he's not number five, but Joe Flacco has that number. But Leo has dibs on number five once Flacco is gone. He's a 70 overall normal developer out of Wisconsin. Looks to be another developmental player that most likely will not be a starter. But who knows what the Atlanta outside linebacker situation. One thing that may be of value is his speed, strength, and off the rails hit power. Just an observation at this point, if he were to move to the outside, he may be a day one starter. With a 20th pick in round number two, Atlanta selected defensive tackle Perrion Winfrey. He has some good attributes like his speed, tackling, and strength but it looks like another developmental player that will most likely not be a day one starter. With back-to-back picks in the second round, the Falcons select strong safety Jaquan Brisker 
out of Penn State. He's a 72 overall right now, and if camp is kind, he could be a day one starter in a much needed position on the roster. Finally, with Atlanta's fifth pick of the draft, they select a left outside linebacker at 69 overall, Nick Benito out of Oklahoma. He's a good rusher, and the Falcons desperately need a real good edge rusher, so that may be an option with him. At last, with their sixth draft pick, the Falcons get a rookie with hidden dev. So they'll be getting at least a star player. Left tackle out of Ohio State, Nicholas Petit Ferrer is selected. He has better than average lead and impact blocking attributes, but he may make a better pulling guard than a left tackle, but well, that's what preseason is for. Atlanta now in the middle of the third round select right outside linebacker Troy Anderson and they get another speedy linebacker. Awareness and pursuit scores are good, but hit power is really good. At a 71 overall, he's listed as a run stopper, but with an 88 speed score, he could be used at least as a starting edge rusher. This could be a really interesting roster battle. Now, with their last pick overall in the third round, 20 pick number 26, Atlanta selects free safety Kirby Joseph out of Illinois. At 69 overall, I don't think that he would be able to rival Richie Grant for that spot, but who knows? I personally would be looking very closely since this could turn into a position battle as well. And now that the draft is done, I've noticed something on the offensive side of the team. I thought that Atlanta would have drafted a halfback to fill Patterson's vacant spot, but as far as I've noticed, that hasn't happened. And of course, kicker and punter haven't been filled either, so those <laughs> those are still needs. It would seem that the Falcons have more work to do before they can start preseason play. With that thought in mind, they start by seeing if they can trade for the rookie they missed out on that they really wanted to draft. James Cook, drafted by the Commanders in the third round just before Atlanta could get to him, The Falcons traded away rookie Nick Benito and an undisclosed draft choice. (laughs) Yeah, undisclosed. And now he's on the Falcons roster. Atlanta also went UDFA fishing to try and fill their preseason roster. And they found halfback Jerry and Ely. And although not a hidden dev, See, he is a 73 overall halfback. He has some very good receiving back attributes, as well as the Falcons may have found the next return specialist. He'll give John Ross a little competition for the job anyway. Now comes the rest of the UDFAs that Atlanta found and were ready for the preseason roster. James Cook improved by leap and bounds in camp and has progressed to an 85 overall. I'd say Atlanta got a much better deal with Cook and shouldn't really give missing out on Patterson a second thought. I mean, (laughs) really, an 85 overall and he is only a rookie. Even though the majority of the wide receivers progress Christian Kirk maintained his top receiver status. Kyle Pitts still tops the tight end position in both right guard Ezra Cleveland and center Matt Hennessy enjoyed major progression and are now on the first team O-line. Defensive tackle Perry and Winfrey was hoped to progress in camp, but it just didn't pan out that way. 
with a reorganization in the linebacker crew and a real nice progression boost for Rashawn Evans. He's now an 88 overall left outside linebacker. The other linebackers definitely didn't get that kind of a boost, but the Falcons are in a much better place entering this season than last. When it came to the safeties, we got fooled a bit. Kirby Joseph progressed enough to overtake Richie Grant for the first string free safety. And although there was no progression, Jaquan Brisker still maintained the top strong safety spot. Atlanta will take this squad into this preseason schedule that draws them the Kansas City Chiefs as their first opponent. Good thing they have that game at home. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Atlanta Falcons franchise on the MMC Broadcasting Network. The Falcons made some big changes in this offseason, most notably the trade of Matt Ryan and seeing Calvin Ridley retire after only four years in the NFL. They definitely have a younger team, although there are some seasoned vets as well. Some holes have been filled, but with some young, inexperienced players. How is that going to affect gameplay this season for the Falcons? To find out, be with us in our next episode as we go through our preseason schedule. Make the necessary cuts to get us down to our 53-man roster, plus, of course, the 12-man practice squad and reveal the 2022 Atlanta Falcons regular season schedule. Until we see you in Mercedes-Benz Stadium for coverage of the Falcons versus Chiefs, this is Husker Eurocat saying so long for now, and have a good day, everyone. <laughs>